In my Brenner review, I said I had my own ideas to cover certain topics, and this is one of them. So let's get into it. Ah, the Sharon Miller era. Considered by many, if not all in the fandom, to be the worst era of Thomas and Friends. And I can't really disagree with that. It really was a dark time for the franchise, and those who loved it. The animation was dull, the characters were more inconsistent than they were in the Brenner era, many of the episodes were terrible, and the dialogue was simply unbearable. I will not be scared, I will find a way to puff home to my friends by the end of the day. Now, what I just said is how I feel about seasons 13 to 16. The films, on the other hand, are a slightly different story. While the seasons are consistently bad, the films in this era are hit and miss. There are some really cool and sometimes unique themes, ideas and concepts throughout these four stories, but there are also things that equal and, on some occasions, outweigh the positives. But instead of bluntly saying they're good or they're bad, let's actually look into each film and see what went well and horribly wrong. And as one would expect, we'll start from the beginning. When released in 2009, Hero of the Rails received a mixed reception from what I've seen, mostly due to being the first film made in full CGI. But quite a few see it as a favourite of theirs. I remember watching it for the first few times and loving it, but what do I think of it now? We'll start with the strengths. The main cast, in this film at least, is well portrayed, and each character feels grown up. They do have their respective personalities, but all the development they've had in the past seems to stick here. Gordon is still proud of being the express engine on Sodor, but isn't a twat about it. James, while upset with himself, isn't cocky, and despite Thomas thinking he could beat Spencer in the test of strength, his strong determination to help and restore Hero makes up for that, which feels like something he would do. Speaking of Hero, I like him. He has a cool backstory, mostly, has a lot of faith in his new friends, and mostly keeps optimistic despite his situation. Togo Igawa, I think I pronounced that correctly, does an incredible job at voicing this character, and all of his emotions are shown perfectly through him. You did everything you could, Thomas. But I know now, I will be sent to the smelter's yard. Also, I love that Spencer is the villain in this. It's interesting to see a steam engine trying to get another scrap, since it really shows what sort of engine he is. He's that focused on being above everyone, that when something he has no knowledge of is happening, he would do anything to uncover it, even if it meant not doing his work, or go as far as to try and get rid of another engine. Pretty messed up, but at least he learnt his lesson in the end. Hero's restoration was another thing I liked. I mean, we've seen engines being repainted and repaired before, but we've never seen this in full detail, such as new parts being built and the body connecting to the chassis. One final thing, the ending. The last bits of dialogue between Thomas and Hero are surprisingly well written, and there's quite a lot of emotion here. Well there was until Hero became a recurring character on Sodor, so yeah, thanks for that Miller. Speaking of annoyances, despite what I've said about the characters, it's kind of off that they would think the Fat Controller would scrap Hero. I mean, he kept Douglas when he wasn't expected, and restored Oliver. But then again, this story wouldn't happen if they did tell him. This film does introduce us to the Steamworks, and I do have some problems with this, but I'm going to save that for Day of the Diesels. One common complaint about the Miller era is the animation, and hopefully you can see why. Now, there are some impressive visuals and shots here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty bad. The lighting in particular makes it incredibly dull, although, to be fair, this was the first film in CGI, and it does slowly improve over time. Also, the voice acting, mainly in the US dub, is terrible. While some of the voices in the UK version are weird... Slow down, Speedy! 
The actors as a whole put a lot more effort into their lines, whereas the US actors don't really seem to try, especially Martin Sherman as Thomas. Fizzling fireboxes, what was that? I can do it, I'll puff for longer, I'll show Spencer I really am stronger. Found you, Thomas. Spencer! He sounds so uninterested for the majority of the film, and there is very little emotion to the point where I feel like just going to sleep. Also, why do the Duke and Duchess are having a summer house built? I mean, don't they already have one? And saving the dumbest thing for last, Hero being the first engine on Sodal. This is completely stupid, because why would a railway look for one of its first engines from miles away? And I'm not saying that because it's unrealistic, since even in a mostly unrealistic world, this would still make no sense. They could still keep the idea that Hero came to Sodor many years ago, but was lost after breaking down. However, saying he was the first engine on the railway is something I don't buy. Not only that, but how was Hero forgotten in the first place? He says he needed to wait for parts from his island, but they never came, which doesn't explain why the workman and the controller at the time abandoned him. This is one aspect that I always found confusing. So overall, Hero of the Rails acts as a decent start to the Miller era, even though it's not an entirely flawless one. The characters are mostly well portrayed, has some relatively emotional moments, and stands out in some areas. However, it does have some issues that could have easily been avoided, but while I don't love this film as much as I did when it first came out, I still think it's okay. Not great, not horrible, but just okay. And at least it's slightly better than... this. To many in the fandom, Misty Island Rescue is considered the worst Thomas film in both the Miller era and in the entire franchise. But now that 8 years have passed since its release, is it as bad as everyone says it is? Well, let's have a look. First off, the music in the opening credits. This is one of the best tracks by Peter and Robert Hart's form in my opinion. It's just so epic. It also helps that it was inspired by the Pirates of the Caribbean theme, which I also love. Second, the overall story. While the execution is terrible, the concept is really interesting. This mysterious island near Sodor that Thomas gets lost on, at first having no way of letting his friends know where he is, and seeking help from an unusual group of engines. It all makes me intrigued about why Misty Island is the way it is, and I honestly wish its history was expanded upon. It's a great idea that's sadly poorly presented. I also love how Misty Island is introduced. It's dark, foggy, there's no signs of civilization anywhere, and it all makes it clear that, at the moment, Thomas is very alone and uncomfortable because of it. Well, unless you include his crew, but since they do nothing, let's pretend they don't exist. When Thomas is reported missing, the engines and the fat controller react as anyone would expect. They're worried and are determined to find him. This is seen as a negative by some people, since this means the engines are abandoning their work. While I can see where they're coming from, considering that one of the main themes in this series is friendship, it would feel out of place if the engines just continued their work, as if Thomas's disappearance didn't even happen. This relates to an issue me and many other people had with Journey Beyond Sodor. When Thomas doesn't return from the mainland, the engines, while concerned, don't seem bothered in going to find him, and when someone does, that being James, he only does it to, in his own words, become a hero. Twat. And lastly, the post credit scene. <laughs> You'll be laughing on the other side of your boilers soon, silly steamers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. While I think we can all agree on what the worst thing is in this film, I see this as the best thing, mainly because no other Thomas film has had a post credit scene that hinted a future event, and back when I saw it, I was very excited to see what was coming next, only to be disappointed. 
So now that we've discussed what I like, let's get into what I dislike. And as you've most likely guessed, there's a lot to talk about here. The presentation. As I said earlier, the story is great, but the overall presentation is awful. The animation is still weak, there's way too much narration, and the dialogue is terrible, particularly the rhyming. A proper place and a proper space to help people in trouble. The rhymes are another common complaint in the Miller era, but are most apparent here. Not only are they cringy, but they constantly happen in this film from start to finish. And easily the worst thing about Misty Island, as I hinted at earlier, is the logging locos. They have little to no personalities besides the fact that they laugh at the most simplest of things. Bash and Dash do nothing but start and finish each other's sentences, and rarely does Ferdinand says anything other than That's right! The Shake Shake Bridge. I haven't got much to say here, but this just looks ridiculous. And it brings the important question, how the hell has no one fell off it? Also, Thomas is a complete twat in this. He often makes bad decisions despite thinking he makes good ones, ignores the logging locos when they need oil to make more steam, and says a lot of crap rhymes. I will not be scared, I will find a way to puff home to my friends by the end of the day. Furthermore, while I don't mind lack of realism, sometimes it gets a bit out of hand. Like how Thomas's raft perfectly lines up with the track on the pier, and the previously mentioned Shake Shake Bridge. And lastly, something that I'd like to call railway racism. I'm a really useful engine too. No, Diesel. I'm sure Sir Topham Hat means a really useful steamy. You'll never be that. Do I really need to explain why this is bad? So, yeah, Misty Island Rescue is pretty bad. Sure, it has a great concept, epic music, and some aspects that make it stand out from the other films, but heavily suffers from a poor execution, bad dialogue, horrific new characters, and so much more. With that said, though, I wouldn't say it's the worst film in the franchise as I personally feel the great race takes that place. Despite all the issues, I still like the ideas, and it's actually a story, instead of a bunch of stories thrown together into an hour long mess. I don't even think it's the worst in the Miller era. That position goes to what came a year later. Like I said with Misty Island, the post credit scene got me excited, but I was left disappointed. How so? Well I'll explain why in a bit, but let's talk about what I do like. Percy being the main character. Like Misty Island's post credit scene, this is the strongest part of the film, since, until Tale of the Brave at least, we've never seen this before, and I wish it was done more often. While the animation is still weak, it does slightly improve here particularly with the fire and smoke effects which I think look really good. The character of Diesel 10. This might be a bit controversial, but I like him in Day of the Diesels. He may not be as aggressive as he was in Magic Railroad, but instead is more calm and manipulative towards Percy. While I prefer the version in Magic Railroad, I still enjoy him here as well. So because I just said that, I feel that some people may ask me, why am I fine with this character change? but hate the changes to Donald and Douglas in the Brenner era. Well, not only did those character changes came out of nowhere, there is absolutely no reason for the twins to act the way they did. The changes to Diesel 10 were unexpected, but it is pretty clear why he is like this. He wants to get Percy on his side, so he can help him and give him easy access to the Steamworks. If he had the same personality as he did previously, and Percy still worked for him, then it would feel a little hard to believe. Donald and Douglas on the other hand, go from caring for each other, to being absolute arseholes to the point where they literally fight each other, and as I said earlier, they act like this for no reason whatsoever. Continuing with Diesel 10, while the voice doesn't fit with his character at all, I do like how the actor delivers some of his lines, showing that Diesel 10, despite being more calm, isn't entirely patient, and nearly loses his temper sometimes. But what about Thomas? Have you asked him to speak to Sir Topham Hatt? Then you must bring Thomas here. That way we will have his full attention. Also, the little gag with Diesel 10 and his shed did give me a few chuckles. 
Speaking of funny moments. Aye, Den fixes all of us diesels with a whisk of his wheels, me hearty. <laughs> I don't know if it's the laugh or salty going cross-eyed, but I always found this bit hilarious. One last thing worth mentioning, the scenes of Percy and the diesels, and later all the steam engines going to the steam works, are pretty cool to watch. Despite the constant narration. And that's it in terms of positives. So let's get into the reasons why this film is quite simply terrible. First off, the amount of narration. Now the narration is a big part of the series, I understand that, but the reason it worked back then was because there wasn't too much of it, and there were pauses between bits of it. These are the mistakes made with the Miller era's narration, and it really shows in Day of the Diesels. Because there's so much of it, there are these awkwardly long pauses between actual dialogue, like when Percy tells that stupid joke, all the Diesel start laughing, but between that and Diesel 10's laugh, he just blankly stares at Percy, just so the narrator can say, And Diesel 10 laughed loudest of all. <laughs> I think it's obvious that he didn't like the joke and laughed just to make Percy feel like he was funny, but wouldn't it be logical to laugh with the other Diesels, or at least before they stop laughing? because since he does neither, it doesn't look convincing. Still on narration, another thing it ruins are the tones of certain scenes. An example is near the end, where everyone is at the steamworks. All attention is on Diesel 10, and everyone is silent, and wondering what his next move is going to be. It's shown as an intense moment, and if you listen closely, there's some rather eerie music in the background. But instead of just using music and the expressions of the characters to tell the story in this scene, we get this. The steamworks was silent. No engine puffed. No engine moved. They waited and watched Diesel 10. If there's one really good thing about the Brenner era that I admittedly should have mentioned in my review, it's that they reduced the amount of narration in each episode. It's still there, but there isn't too much of it. Back on topic, the way Percy reacts to Thomas making friends with Belle is a bit silly. Just because he's made a new friend doesn't mean he's no longer your friend. He's done this several times. I will be fair though, Thomas isn't any better. At certain points he just ignores Percy for no reason, even when he's doing nothing and seems to have enough time to hear him talk. At one point he lets Flynn stay at the sheds in Percy's spot which Percy takes the wrong way. Yet, despite clearly being upset and starting to tear up, Thomas just responds with, Where have you been, Percy? Oh yeah, never mind the fact that you're clearly unhappy and about to cry. Who cares about that? Where have you been? Best friends, my ass. Earlier in the video, I said I would save my problems with the steelworks for this film, because the problems are very apparent here. Now, the steamworks would be fine if Sodal's railways were entirely run by steam engines, but they're not. Well, not anymore. Aside from pushing the whole railway racism thing I mentioned earlier, what's actually the point of two separate works to repair one type of engine each? Wouldn't it be more logical to have one work that repairs all types of engines? It would take up less room as well. It also doesn't make sense because before Day of the Diesels, the Steamworks has been seen repairing diesels. So what's even the point of calling it a Steamworks if you don't just repair steam engines? And saving the worst part of this film for last, the main plot. Like Misty Island, it's poorly portrayed, but unlike Misty Island that had an interesting concept, Day of the Diesels plot falls off the rails in so many areas. The story is basically Diesel 10 wanting to take over the steelworks and demand the fat controller to fix the diesel works with the help of Percy. In the end, he gets what he wants and everyone is happy. Okay, now let's have a deeper look into this. First off, the fat controller is in control of the diesel works, but if that's the case, why would he allow it to fall under the condition it is? It has been shown several times that he does care about his engines and the conditions they live in. Like in Buffer Bother, when he sees Ben's damaged buffers, he doesn't go, Oh, I'll make arrangements to have your buffers repaired in like 20 years. Instead, he sends him to the works straight away. Your buffers are damaged. You must report to the engine works immediately for a new set of buffers. You could argue that he didn't know about the state of the diesel works, but that actually leads into my next point. The reason he found out about Ben's buffers 
was because he was inspecting the engines at the quarry, making sure they were in good order. It is his railway after all. So, does he simply not do this with the diesel works? Why? I'm honestly not surprised Diesel 10 thinks he doesn't care about him. But alright, let's assume this is the case and that Diesel 10 and his mates don't tell him because they believe he won't listen to them. But what about Soldy and Mavis? They know that the diesel works is in disrepair, so why don't they tell the fat controller? He would undoubtedly listen to them. With that said, however, when the fat controller says that there will be a new diesel works and everyone must wait their turn, I'm not entirely sure of the context behind that statement. On one hand, he could be saying this due to the fact that there was a fire, so of course it will need to be rebuilt. But on the other hand, I can't help but get the feeling that he knew about the diesel works crappy state and did have plans to eventually restore it. Now, if that was the case, why the hell didn't he tell the diesels about this? This whole mess could have been avoided. Now, this might not have been what he meant, it could be what I said earlier. However, this doesn't change the issue of the fat controller not inspecting the place like he does to the other locations and the engines on the railway. Oh, and don't get me started on Thomas giving Bell a negative impression on diesels. Well, okay, some of them can be devious, but the way Thomas says this gives the impression that all the diesels are like this. Which is bollocks because we see friendly diesels in the same film. Also, why does Diesel 10 react the way he does near the end? His plan was to take over the steamworks to get the fat controller's attention, but when the fat controller does arrive, he starts to cower and whimper. This was your plan, you wanted to see him. Well, here he is, but all of a sudden you're scared? You have a claw, you could have easily grabbed the fat bastard, and since the rail staff in this era do little to nothing, there'd be very little stopping him. Put simply, Diesel 10 has no reason to be afraid. Whew, what a mess. So, with all this in mind, I don't think it's any secret that I consider the Day of the Diesels to be the worst film in the Miller era, even worse than Misty Island Rescue. It does have the unique concept of Percy being the main character. I like how Diesel 10 was written, and there were some little positives here and there. But not enough to outweigh all the crap in this one. There's too much narration, some of the characters are poorly written, the concept of the steam and diesel works are completely pointless, and of course, it has a ridiculously stupid story. While Misty Island at least had a great story despite the poor execution, this film's plot would need to be reworked in almost every area to even make sense. However, I'm happy to say that we have just gotten through the worst of this era, and that we're about to cover what I consider the best. So let's cure ourselves from the mess we've been through, and discuss what came next. Back when this first came out, I remember not caring for it that much, which was probably due to what came before, and me being into other things at the time. Then I saw it and, put simply, I loved it, and I still do today. Let's start with the animation. While it's still rather simple, it improves in two areas. There are more unique camera movements, with long panning shots of the quarry, which help show the large scale. Then there are the narrow gauge engines, which look fantastic, and are very closely based on their real life counterparts. For those who didn't know, Nitrogen Studios went to the Talaflin Railway in Wales to see the basis of the Scarlery engines. Talaflin, Dolgok, Sir Hayden, Edward Thomas and Midlander. This was so they could get measurements to use when making the CGI models, and have them resemble the Talaflin engines as close as possible. This was easily Nitrogen's best decision when working on Thomas. It means that the narrow gauge engines are well scaled and are highly detailed. Next up is the music. The music throughout most of the Miller era was okay, but not very memorable. Blue Mountain Mystery's soundtrack on the other hand is an exception, from epic trumpet music that introduces the quarry, to slow and more emotional pieces that uses the flute when Luke is around. That leads me into the best thing about this film, Luke. Luke is easily my favourite character in CGI Thomas, mainly due to his backstory and how it has affected him. When he came to Sodor, he accidentally knocked an engine into the sea while being unloaded. Upon never seeing him again, his only conclusion is that he was scrapped due to being no longer useful. So, basically, 
Luke spent most of his life on Sodor, believing he got another engine, well, killed. Now, we do find out that Victor was the yellow engine and was repaired, but the theme of deep regret and shame is well shown through Luke and makes him a rather tragic character. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's tear jerking, but the emotion is felt here. He must have been taken to the smelter's yard. He couldn't be really useful anymore. And it was all because I wanted to go first. It was my fault. If I had waited my turn, Thomas, I would never have knocked him into the sea. I'm still scared, Thomas. My narrow gauge friends know I'm here. But I'm sure if the other engines find me, they'll tell Mr. Percival. And he'll tell Sir Topham Hatt. And they'll both send me away from Sodor forever. I also really love how Luke grows throughout the film. At the start, he's very afraid of anyone who isn't a narrow gauge engine and is hesitant to trust Thomas, but soon befriends him and they both work well alongside each other. Then near the end, despite being found out and showing fear, he's still willing to go and help Thomas when he's in danger, still seeing him as his friend. And when he and Victor reunite, with Victor telling him to come to the steelworks and laughing joyfully, was pretty satisfying. Put simply, Luke's arc in this film is great. It was also nice to see Victor get more developed here. We learnt about how he came to Sodor, having to learn the English language and receiving his red livery. Then there's Paxson. I know what we see here is a bit of a contrast to how he was portrayed in Day of the Diesel, but since he never really had a personality there, I'm fine with him being more friendly. Like Luke, Paxson has a regret but that's after telling Diesel the secret, yet despite that, he's very conflicted about whose side to be on. In the end of course, he makes the right choice and brings Victor to the quarry, but it's a nice addition to his character regardless. Moving away from the characters, I really like the wide variety in narrow gauge rolling stock, both in open wagons and vans, most of which are based off designs seen on the Teleflin and, possibly, other narrow gauge railways. Next is the flashbacks to previous events. The Scar for Percy, The Sad Story of Henry, and Down the Mine. While these were most likely here for fan service, they also help with the overall theme of this film, which is regrets and moving on from them. And one last thing to mention, The Spinning Eyes makes its first appearance in CGI, and it was a nice little touch. As for the negatives, there isn't too much to say here that wasn't in the last few specials. The dialogue isn't great, but thankfully isn't as bad as it was in Day of the Diesels. Although, one thing that always bothered me was how Scarlery and the others think Thomas betrayed them. Now, to be fair, Thomas did mention the yellow engine when saying that he spoke to Victor, and Diesel showing up didn't make things any better, but even so, seeing the engines ignore Thomas and not give him a chance to explain himself is a little out of character. Also, Thomas's plan to reach Luke, while does show his determination and how much he cares about him, is a little silly. Not to mention dangerous, considering he nearly dies. I think that's it in terms of major problems, but I remember something else, something most people chose to forget. What was it? Oh yeah, this bloody scene! Yep, during the end song, a stupid little scene plays that has some joke about how there is still a yellow engine, as well as to add a little bit more merchandise. Because, apparently, there wasn't quite enough to come from this film. Aside from that, I do have some more nitpicky things. For instance, why did they have Percy's accident at Mayfoyt's? Wouldn't it make more sense for it to take place at Natford, as that more resembles the set used in Season 3? Why did they use those goofy green and red trucks in Down the Mine? What was stopping them from using the standard grey trucks? Also, while it's kind of been resolved now, at the time, seeing all the narrow gauge engines working at the Blue Mountain Quarry gave the impression that this was the only job they did. Don't get me wrong, it's a large quarry, so of course it would need more than one engine to run it, but what about the passenger trains, or other goods besides slate and stone? One last thing, the shot of Sir Handel cutting in front of Reneas and Peter Sam. How the hell did Reneas just miss hitting him, I'll never know. I mean, what if he did? He would have derailed and could have fell off the cliff, and we all know it wouldn't have been the first time. In conclusion, Blue Mountain Mystery is easily the strongest in the Miller era, 
and is one of my personal favourites. Despite a few flaws here and there, I like the roles of Luke, Victor and Paxson, I adore Luke's character arc, the look and scale of the quarry is amazing, and the overall tone is something Thomas and Friends has been severely lacking, both before and after this film's release. All of this results in Blue Mountain Mystery ending the Miller era on a rather shaky, yet high on positive note. Well, that's all the Miller era films. So, what are my final thoughts? Like I said at the beginning, while seasons 13 to 16 were constantly bad, the films were a mixed bag, ranging from really great to absolutely terrible. In many ways they remind me of the Star Wars prequels, in that they had really good and interesting ideas, but suffered due to poor executions, although the specifics on why are different. For the prequels, it was because there was so much going on in them, that three films simply weren't enough to flesh these ideas out. Whereas with the Miller films, it was mostly due to bad animation, dialogue and characters. I often wonder what these films would have been like if Brenner wrote them, and what he would have done to make them better. Considering he was the script editor on Blue Mountain Mystery, I imagine that would have mostly stayed the same. At the end of the day, as a whole, the Miller era is bad, but the films at least should be remembered for what they did right, and not just what they did wrong. If I had to recommend one of them, it would be Blue Matter Mystery. Yeah, I said Hero of the Rails was decent, but when the two are compared, it's no competition. Now, you may have noticed that I've been very specific on both the positives and negatives, unlike my Brenner era review, where I mostly focus on the negatives. But don't misinterpret that as me saying the Miller era is better than the Brenner one because it sure as hell isn't. Looking back, I realised that I was rather unfair in that video, and that I should have talked more about the positives than I did. With that said though, I still stand by the points I did make, such as there's very little to care about, the poor writing of some of the characters, and the small number of story arcs that happen over a number of episodes. Despite all that, Brenner's work is definitely an improvement from Miller, as a lot of the episodes, while having little to care about, are entertaining, and I'd feel harsh if I didn't give him and his writing staff credit for at least that. So what do you think of the Miller era films? Did you agree with most of my points, or did you think me saying actual positive things about this era was complete maddening? Let me know in the comments below. Now I would like to discuss the future of these sort of videos. While I like making reviews, they do take a while to put together. That is to be expected of course, but I want to focus more on the IFRS, as that is the main thing I want to create on this channel, so don't expect another video like this anytime soon. There are many things I want to review, some of which aren't Thomas related, but those ideas are going to be put to the side for the time being. Anyway, thanks for watching and bye for now.